Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, somebody. Hallelujah. He is worthy to be praised. Amen. Amen. Let me remind you of what the psalmist declares. He said, from the rising of the sun until the going down of the same, his name is worthy to be praised. Don't let it become monotonous. Don't let it become a routine. Don't let it become a formality. But every time we call on that great name, there ought to be some stirring in our soul. Hello, somebody. Amen. There ought to be something in our heart that's, that tells us that we're calling upon the name of the Lord our God. He is a great and awesome God. And He deserves worship. And so tonight as we come, I encourage you to worship Him. I encourage you to bless His holy name. He's a good God. Amen. He's an incredible God. He's a wonderful Savior. He is excellent. He is incredible. He is mighty. Mighty to save, mighty to deliver, mighty to keep. He has kept us. And so tonight we come to bless his name. I want to take this privilege and this opportunity to once again welcome every one of us to our Bible studies tonight as we come to study the word of Almighty God. Amen. We are reminded that we are to study to show thyself approved, a workman unto God. Need it not be ashamed, but rightly divide the word of truth. I sense the Holy Spirit is calling us to a time of prayer. So let us just bow our heads right where you are. Merciful Savior, loving Lord. We still our hearts in your presence, mighty God. And we acknowledge how awesome you are. How incredible a God you are. How wonderful, how great the Lord. And so tonight as we come in your presence, we acknowledge your greatness. We ascribe to you worship. We ascribe to you all the honor, the praise, and the glory. We magnify your great name. And so, mighty God, as we come to study tonight, I pray for this audience, mighty God, every person that is in the house, physical and vision of Hope Church of God, and everyone that is watching online, and everyone that is listening tonight, mighty God, some may have gone through a, a, a very challenging week, but I lift up the saints, the body of Christ, the believers before you tonight, mighty God. I pray that you will reassure your people one more time, mighty God. Give us all the confidence to know that it is well, because indeed it is well. And so, mighty God, we, we worship you tonight. We praise your great name. I pray for your people tonight. Touch your people one more time. Bless them, God, in their endeavors, in their pursuit, in their going out, in their coming in, and in their sitting down, and in their uprising. Mighty God, I pronounce peace over your people tonight, over the, the minds and the hearts of your people tonight. I speak blessings over the life of your people tonight, mighty God, as we submit everything. Guide this study tonight, Holy Spirit. Anoint your son again and enable me to speak under the, uh, as the oracle of Almighty God under the influence of your anointing. Have your way in our midst as we glorify your name now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. amen. Hallelujah. The Lord. Let me welcome our online audience tonight. You have done well to join us one more Friday evening as we study the word of Almighty God um, together. Again, I consider it to be um, an honor and a privilege that you have afforded me this opportunity to be able to come before you and to share the word of Almighty God as we study um, together. Again, please help us to increase our online presence by like and share and telling others, share the link and tell others about this um, Bible study, about Vision of Hope, Church of God, a place where hope is restored and dreams come alive. We're studying the book of Revelation. And it is my hope that next week, God's willing, we'll finish up all seven churches. And then we will get into the complexity of the book of uh, Revelation. Because I know many of you have been waiting for that. But I just could not run through on the churches. It's still um, good teaching, good information that you need to, to learn from this. And so we are getting to the end of the seven churches. Tonight we are going to finish up the church of um, Sardis, I think it is. And then we're going to jump on to uh, Philadelphia. I'm not sure if we'll get to um, Laodicea 
um, and tonight what we want to study. So let us get back into the word. We are in Revelation chapter 3 and tonight we're going to be starting around about verse number 5. But as always, let us do a little bit of a recapping um, from last week. Um, last time, which was last Friday when we were here, we looked at um, the church of um, Tyatira and we noted that the Lord told them that no added burden would be placed upon them and that they should hold fast till he comes. Um, the Lord promised uh, them that uh, the right that they would have the right to rule in his millennial kingdom. And again, what I need us to understand tonight is that these promises that you are seeing at the end or at the beginning of these seven um, letters to the churches, they are not a um, blessing that is, is, is specifically designed for those local congregations. They are blessings that is reserved for the body of Christ, the people of God, the children of God. Amen, somebody? Amen. So they are more what we would call corporate blessing. They are things that they are blessings that we will all inherit. There are certain specific blessings that certain individual might receive. Like for instance, somebody talk about um, stars in your crown or or. or Will you get a crown? Every believer will wear a crown of, of righteousness. But not every... And there are different crowns that the Bible speaks about. And this is not the place for it tonight. I just want us to understand that there are certain specific blessing and reward. A reward actually that certain believers will receive while others will not receive those rewards. Are you still here with me? Amen. It don't mean that they're not saved. But it means that our work here on earth will come for something in heaven. Hello somebody. Look at your neighbor and tell the neighbor, your work here on earth will come for something in heaven. Oh, good God Almighty, you all should be excited about that. Oh, you don't understand. You, you don't understand. You don't get it. Your work here on earth will come for something in another. Oh, good God Almighty. I feel I could preach right there, my brother. I feel I could preach a message right there. Your work here on earth will come for something in another world. Good God Almighty. I might just preach that Sunday. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I tell you, don't let us not get excited in this place here tonight. Because we may not conduct Bible study the way we normally would. But it, it, it's amazing how, how we can stay on earth and work. And God in heaven is taking note of what we're doing. And will reward us accordingly. What, what an awesome privilege we have to serve the Lord. And to serve Him faithfully. And serve Him wholeheartedly. Amen somebody. Glory be to God. All right, so let's continue to recap before I get carried away. All right, so the church at Sardis, uh, we, we talk about that as well too. Um, right at the beginning, right at the beginning, uh, they received a harsh rebuke um, from the Lord in place of an opening commendation. So far from at the beginning of each letter up to this point here. So if we look how many letters we have so far, one, two, three, four... Um, five churches and four out of those five churches they, the Lord started out with a commendation for each of them but he started out the church at Sardis with a rebuke because they were acting as if they, they are the ones who saved themselves. Hello somebody. We have some folks in church today who is acting as if they are the author of their own salvation. Uh, let me tell you something. The Bible tells us that the Lord resists the proud. Are you still here somebody? Amen. Oh good God Almighty. So yeah. So he started out with a harsh rebuke um, with the church of, um, of um, Sardis. Uh, he also warned them that he would um, judge them um, swiftly and quickly if they did not take note of their spiritual uh, condition. But in the midst of everything, the Lord spoke of a holy remnant that was left in the church of Sardis. And that is where we're probably going to be picking up from tonight. We want to talk about the holy um, remnant as we probably pick up at verse number four. So let's read a couple of verses real quickly. Um, from verse 4. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments and they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. 
He that had an ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit said unto the churches. Then we jump down to verse number um, 7, the church of Philadelphia. And to the angel of the church of in Philadelphia write, These things say, He that is holy, he that is true, he that had the key of David, he that opened open it and no man shut it, and he that shut it and no man opened it. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Verse number 9, I will probably stop there. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come, and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. So we're going to stop um, right there tonight. And we're going to just pick up at verse number 4. With um, dissecting. So verse number 4 says. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis. Which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white. For they are, they are, they are worthy. So here Jesus is saying to the church at Sardis that. Even though the church, the, 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 the corporately, the church was, was not where the Lord would expect the church to be, where the Lord would want the church to be, the church was living quite the opposite of what was expected of them as to how they were supposed to represent the name of the Lord, as how they were supposed to love and live among each other and to, to reflect and let their light shine in the world. They were doing quite the contrary. But here it is, the Lord said, even in the midst of that, there is a remnant. May I submit to you that every congregation, every denomination, every church that started out well, those, the ones that have drifted along the way, I want to submit to you that even in the midst of everything, there is always a remnant that will not bow their knees. Are you still here with me, yes, somebody? Yes. There is always a remnant who is going to hold fast to the true gospel and to the things of Almighty God who, remember, remember the story of... Um, Elijah, I think it was, when, it, when he was running away from Jezebel, he said, I am the only one who is left. Hello, somebody. The Lord said, no, you got this thing wrong. I have 700 who have not bowed their knees. Are you still here? So sometimes you and I may not know, but there's always those who are living right and doing right. And God is the one who has seen all of that. So it says here, it says, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And the word defiled their garments there, meaning that their lifestyle was holy and acceptable in the sight of God. As Romans um, 12, verse 1 and 2, I beseech thee, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies holy, acceptable, so on and so forth. So it says here, there are those in the church who have not, what? Defiled their garments. So in other words, they were not contaminated by sin and with sin. They were not living a double standard lifestyle. They were not living one thing in the eyes of the public and in private they were living something. Else. They were consistent to the word of God. They were consistent to the teaching of the pastors and those who were in, in charge and, in, and most of all they were obedient to the things of Almighty God. So the Bible considered those that they did not defile their garments. So in other words, if you are living here here on earth and you have not lost your mind, you're going to need some kind of covering. So physically we wear clothes. And if we wear clothes and we wear them for a while and we do certain things out there, those, those garments get what soiled and dirty, correct? Yes. So here now, the Bible is referring to their spiritual garment. So, so the Lord is saying that you can walk circumstance. Are you here with me? You can walk and you don't have to get, your, your, your garment don't have to get stained. Those of us remember who have it white and we do everything to make sure it don't get stained. Talk to me somebody. Amen. And there are certain kind of colors that if stain catch it, it's over because you can't use bleach on it. Are you still here with me? Amen. So these believers, uh, their spiritual garment was such that they did not allow it to be spotted. They were mindful that they cannot allow anything, so to speak, to get a 
their spiritual garment to soil it. So the Lord here said to them, there's a few in Sardis which have not what? Defied or contaminated or messed up their garment. And they shall what? Walk with me in white. Uh, uh, for they are worthy. Again, the white there, they shall walk with me in white. The Lord is signified. That signified purity and holiness. So the Lord is saying, they will walk with me in holiness. They will walk with me in uprightness. Because why? Uh, because what they are holy. Their lifestyle will be characterized by holiness. There are some people in the church. I know... I know this might be this might sound a little funny, but there are some people in the church who they are real saints. <laughs> Hello, I know I told you it's going to probably sound a little bit funny because all of us are supposed to be saints. Amen. I think I think probably this is one thing you can you can give to the to the to the uh, to the Catholic because I think they get they get it right because they refer to to the believer they they refer to each other as saint. Saint so and so, Saint so and so, and mm-hmm. but in Pentecostalism, when when you look at one, when we look at each other, called Saint, we some of us think they've lost their mind. Hello, Amen. hello. Yes. That's how the devil deceives us. Yes. Because the truth is, yes. you're a saint. Yes. Hello. Amen. And the opposite of a saint is a sinner. So if you're if you're not a saint, then you are a sinner, and, because, and that's supposed to characterize your lifestyle. So as Christians, we're saints, but we don't refer to each other in Pentecostalism as, say, as saints. All right? We talk about Christian, yes. but the truth is, probably Christian is a more serious name to go by, even rather than saints. Because here's what happened: Christian was a nickname. Christian was a nickname. And they were, the Bible said in the book of Acts, it said they were first called Christians in Antioch because they act like Christ. You know somebody. Amen. So when somebody call us um, a Christian or a child of God, that's supposed to bring a certain awareness to us that we are representative of Christ. So that even that is even a more serious name to go by than evil saints. Yes. Because if you call somebody a saint, the first thing you're thinking of holiness, right? Amen. But when they call you a Christian, we we, we, we we somewhat okay, that's a general term and we can behave and but they were called Christian because they were Christ like. So here it is, the Lord says that they are gonna what? They're gonna walk with him in white for they are worthy. Hello, somebody. Amen. They are worthy. Here, here, here's my take on, on the Bible. Here's my take on the Bible. And, and, and listen to me and hear me well. And don't misinterpret what I'm saying. Here, hear me. Here's my take on the Bible. There are times when I'm reading the Bible and I know the entire Bible is the inspired word of God. Don't get me wrong. But they are certain statements in the Bible that carries, in my opinion, carries more weight than others. What do I mean? Anything is spoken by Christ carries more weight than everything else in the rest of the book. Why? Because the rest of the book, the rest of the book, the rest of the book, um, outside of the words spoken by Christ, even though the entire book was written by, by, authored by men, but outside of the words spoken by Christ, the rest of the words came from, from people who were messed up and flawed like you and I. But God was still able to use those flawed and messed up people to write and call it the inspired word of Almighty God. So you find that, because watch this now, it's not everything some of those inspired men that they wrote that came out of their own mouth as their own testimony or lifestyle, it's not everything that they say you're going to emulate or do, correct? So some of, you, you got to understand, so the word of Christ here carries weight over everything else. Why am I saying that? I'm saying that to say this to us, that the mere fact that Christ declares them worthy is an incredible commendation. Are you still here with me, somebody? 
Are you still here with me, somebody? So in other words, if it was Peter who called them worthy, if it was John who called them worthy, you and I probably, at least, I would probably say, you know what, I hear you, Peter, or I hear you, John, but 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 if Jesus called me, me worthy, then, oh, listen, no, you can't get higher than that. He, he, you know, Peter called me worthy, but, but he, he's talking from a vantage point as a fallen human being like myself. You're not talking, you're not getting what I'm trying to say. But Jesus calling me worthy, it's come from perfection himself. So he carries a whole, are you still here with me this evening? Can I get somebody to understand what I'm trying to say? Yes. So look at the text now. So the Bible said, the Lord said, they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy. And like I've said before, I'm going to tell you again, there's one thing that I'm working for. Every one of us have ulterior motive when we do things in life. And I do have one as a pastor and as a Christian. And my ulterior motive is that when I get to heaven, I want to hear Jesus said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. If I can get that from Christ, I don't need nothing else in eternity. You're not understanding me because it is coming from the word, from the mouth of the master himself. Words spoken by the master means something. Or you're not talking back to me. In this country here we say, we call the president the one who holds the control, the bully pulpit. So whenever time the president go up and say something, nine out of ten times or eight out of ten times, he's going to get it done because it was spoken by the president. Why? Because the president word um, carries weight. They're not talking back to me. The word of Jesus carries weight. And what so he said, they are worthy. That is why I want to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Talk to me somebody. Hello. Amen. And watch this now. So he said, he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And watch this now again. Earlier on, I told you that there are some, there are some blessings that are corporate blessings. Here, it is not referring to just the church at Sardis here. Are you still here? It is referring to believers universally. But watch this now. I don't believe that every Christian is going to hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Yes. Hello? Amen. I just messed up half the church now. Let me say it again. Not every Christian is going to hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Because that well done, thou good and faithful servant is going to be based upon what you do here on earth as a child of God. There are some devils who call themselves Christian who when they get to heaven, they ain't going to hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Unless somebody made a mistake somewhere. Ah, oh, good God help. Are you still here? I, I, I used to be here. Amen. I said, unless somebody made a mistake somewhere, Reverend, not every believer will hear, well done, no good and faithful servant. Oh, good God. Remember now, remember the, 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 um, the parable of the talent. Uh, um, who didn't get the commendation? Is that all of them will get the, the commendation? No. We're going to get back to that at some other point here. But he said that he that overcome it, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. Again, white there signify holiness, signify purity, signify righteousness. And I will not what? I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. You already Savior. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I will confess thy name before my Father. There might be a roll call in heaven. Are you here, somebody? It says here, and before his angel. And of course, it says, he that have an ears to hear, let him hear. Verse number seven. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these things say, he that is holy, he that is true, he that had the key of David, he that openeth and no man shut it. All right, let's see if we can closely examine that um, tonight. The church at Philadelphia. I want you to again see the introduction. If you're following all the churches so far, I need you to examine the introduction that Christ uses. 
the introduction that he, he uses to introduce himself to that particular church reverend is, is in line with what he's going to say to the church. Go back and look at the, 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 the five. This is what number this is what number six. Okay, go back and look at the five previous churches. Look at how Christ introduces himself to them. And look, each name that he uses is in line with what he wants to speak to the church. Mm -hmm. Are you here? Amen. Look at this now. Look at that. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write these things, say what? He that is what? He that is holy, he that is true, and he that and he that are the keys. The key of David, he that opened it and no man shut it, and shut it and no man opened it. Watch this now. The church at Philadelphia, the Lord has no criticism for that church. Hello, somebody. The Lord has no rebuke and no negative thing. Or anything that he chastised them on. Are you here? Right. So in other words. The church at Philadelphia was holy. Yes. The church at Philadelphia was doing what they expected to, uh, to be done. Uh, uh, what the Lord expected of them. So the Lord introduces himself to them. As the one who is, who is holy. So, so, so I believe the Lord is saying to them. I am holy and I am the one who is keeping you holy. I am truth, uh, and I am the one who is causing you to walk in, in the truth. So watch the text now, and it says here, He that had the key, uh, he that had the key of David, he that uh, opened up and no man shut it. So the key of David there would, would, would suggest um, to us that the Lord is saying, I am the one that holds the key to the kingdom of heaven, to your blessing. The key there signify authority. It signify blessing. It signify access and so on and so forth. So watch this now. In in the book of um, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 22 and verse number 22, listen to what it says here. It says, and, and the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. When we talk about David here, David was one of the most blessed king that has ever ruled the nation of Israel. So when God wants to make certain analogy or certain, uh, get across certain points to his people, he referred to David. Are you still here? He referred to the kingdom as the house of David or the kingdom of David. He said, there shall not cease a man to sit upon who? Upon the throne of who? Upon the throne of David. David was not the one who lived forever. It was Christ, but the Lord uses David uh, to, 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 to it give us a picture or an image of what Christ's kingdom was going to be like. So here Jesus said now, a language that they can understand, he said, I hold the key of David. Are you here? See what Isaiah said? The Lord speaking to the prophet Isaiah. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. Referring to the Lord. Will I lay upon his shoulder. So he shall open and none shall shut. And he shall shut and none shall open. So he's talking to the church and to a Jewish community. And he said, I hold the key. What key does? Hello somebody. What key does? Key give you what? Access. So if you're going to have access to the kingdom, the kingdom of God, guess who you got to go to? Jesus. Hello, somebody. Amen. If you're going to have access in the kingdom, or if you're going to have authority, or rights, or rule, or reign in the kingdom, you're going to have to go to the one who holds a key. Hello, somebody. Amen. You don't believe me? All right, Matthew, Matthew 16, 19 tells us this. Matthew 16, 19 tells us this. And Jesus is speaking, says, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. So the Lord is saying, Access to my kingdom is through me. Are you here, somebody? So he said to the church at Philadelphia, I am the one who holds the key 
But David had opened up and no man can shut and shut it and no man can can open. So, so he said, I am your blessing. I am your gateway to your blessing. I'm the doorway to your blessing. Look at verse number 8. Look at verse number 8. I know thy works. Look at that. I know thy works. If you notice the rest of church, the rest of churches, he started out before he started to bless them. He started out by pointing out at their downfall, if you will. Are you here? But in this context here, he started out by, by blessing or commending the church at Philadelphia. Now verse 8, he says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. Are you still here? I have set before thee an open door. No man can shut it. Ah, uh, look at that. I have set before thee an open door. Good God, I used to hear somebody. I have set before thee an open door. I have set before thee. I have placed opportunity before thee. I have placed you in the kingdom. And I will provide opportunity for you to serve and grow and be blessed in the kingdom. I have set before you an open door. Go back down to the verse now. He said, I have the key to the kingdom of, of, of David. Or to the house of David. And he said, I open what? I know my shop. He, 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 he declares it first. He said, I open and no man shut. So he said, now Philadelphia, I'm opening a door for you. And guess what? If he opens it, you're not talking back to me. If he opens it, nobody can shut it. Good God Almighty. That is why when the Lord gets ready to bless you in a particular way, no devil from hell can stop it. Oh, you're not talking back to me. He will move mountains in order to bless you. He will cause the sea to be divided in order to bless you. You're not talking back to me. There's no Nothing that he will not do in order to bless you. If he's going to bless you, there's nobody can stop it. Amen. Amen. Right. So he says here, I know thy works. He said, it's a Philadelphia. I know you as a church. I know what you're doing. I know your labor. I know your commitment. I know your faithfulness. He said, I have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it. Mm. Hallelujah. They sure will try. And, and one of the amazing things, and this is a sidebar, one of the amazing things that I've discovered in my walk with the Lord Jesus Christ over the years, brothers and sisters, is the fact that there are times when the Lord will open doors in your life and he will allow the enemy to make several attempts to shut it. Amen. Amen. That never happened to you. He will open doors in your life and he will allow the enemy to try to shut it. Yes. And sometimes you and I get panic because it really looks like it's going to be shut. Yes. It really comes close. Hello, somebody. Amen. Well, you're not talking back to me. So here, here's what you do. And I, let me give you a little bit of nuggets here before we move on. Here's what you do in instances like those. Just keep on repeating the word of the Lord. There are times when the Lord will bless you and, and it looks like you're going to lose your blessing, reverend. You've got to go back to what the proverb said. The blessings of the Lord, it make it rich. And he added no sorrow with it. I don't know how this is going to work itself out. I don't know how it's going to work itself out. But I believe it's going to work itself out. The blessings of the Lord, it make it rich. And he added no sorrow with it. I might be struggling with the blessing right now. I didn't expect it to be so heavy, but it's heavy right now. But the Bible said he added no sorrow with it. That means I'm going to get to my destination. I you still here, somebody. So he told the church at Philadelphia, I'm going to open a door for you and nobody can shut it. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm trying not to get too excited in this place here tonight. You all, I can get excited all by myself. Hello, somebody. Good God Almighty. So he said here, yeah, and no man can shut it, right? He said, for thou, watch this now, watch this now. For thou has little strength. Oh, good God Almighty. Here, 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 here's part of the reason why I'm going to bless you. Here, here's part of the reason why I'm going to bless you. I want everybody to see the God in you. I want everybody to see the God in your life. I want everybody to see that I'm the one who is doing it. Because watch this now. The church of Philadelphia, the Lord said, you're weak. You have little strength. Are you still here, somebody? 
No, so, 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 so when everybody look at the church at Philadelphia, they're probably laughing at them. Hello. Yes, yes. But the Lord said, "No, has little strength and and watch this and has kept my word." And has not denied my name. The Lord said, though everybody is looking at you and they're ridiculing you and they're thinking that you're crazy and that you're not doing what everybody is, is doing and you think that you're holier than thou and as a congregation you, you segregate yourself in a certain way because you don't want to mix with the kind of behavior that is taking place there or whatever. And so they look at you and they, they, they ostracize you if you will. But the Lord said, I see and I know that you're not strong but I'm going to open the door. Hello, somebody. That door is going to give you access. That door is going to give you blessing. That door is going to provide what it takes for the church to grow and survive. Are you still here? Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I know I haven't given you much um, specific point tonight, and but please forgive me. I'll, I'll make up for that next week. Because my points there all over the place. <laughs> Uh, uh, let's survive. You're good so far? Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Verse number 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them come to worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. So watch this. Watch this. So we have seen that in... Um, in, uh, I forgot which of the other church we have seen that in. But we saw that in the church and where the Lord said, These Jews who are pretending to be Jews are who outwardly they are Jews, but inwardly they are Gentile, if you will, are pagans. And they, they are, it would appear as if they have come together with the Gentile population and they are persecuting the church. It, it, it's a, so it says here, look at the verse again. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, synagogue there associated with who? With Jews, right? Mm -hmm. Gentiles don't use synagogue. They have a different name for it. They don't use synagogue. So I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. So those who are professing to be Jews and in their hearts they're not because again, the true Jews will at some point understand even if they don't join the church, they will not persecute the church. They will try to stay neutral of the church. Are you still here? But for whatever reason, it would appear as if... Um, these Jews here, along with probably the pagans or the Gentiles, were coming together and they were persecuting the church of Almighty God. Are you still here, somebody? Amen. So it says, it says, Behold, I will make them, um, which are synagogue of Satan, say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will, what? I will make them come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. So I uh, uh, watch this now. Don't get the impression that they're going to worship the, 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 the church or worship before the church. I want to suggest to you that the text is saying that God is saying, I am going to cause them to come and see who you are and see how I am blessing you and they will realize that I have loved thee. So the, the Lord said, I'm going to put them in a position to acknowledge who you are. Amen. Are you here? Amen. Yeah. So it says, I will um, I'll come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. So I'm going to let them come as it were worship, if you will. I'm going to let them come and see and acknowledge because the door that I'm going to open, the blessing that I'm going to be pouring out on you, when everybody around you see, they will know that God favors you. Hello, somebody. Amen. There's one, there's something about the blessing of the Lord that when the Lord is truly blessing you, that people around you will see and they will know that it is the Lord who is blessing you. They cannot deny it. They, 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 they might not want your God, but they can't deny that your God is blessing you. Hello. So this is what the Lord is saying. Uh, they may not want me as their God, but they will not be able to deny that I am blessing you. What, what, what rest of the verse say? And know that what? That I have loved be. So, God is going to make the church at Philadelphia so pronounced, so prominent, so obvious, so stand out in the community in a good way that 
they will know the persecutors and the Judaizers and they that are steering down the church will realize that, listen, God really loved that church. Amen. Hello. Amen. Yes. God really loved that. And that's what he said. He said, and to know that I have loved thee. So in other words, God is saying, the Lord is saying to the church at Philadelphia, I'm going to set you up in such a way that they will know that I love you. And interestingly, look at the language that he uses, that I have loved thee. And what, lo what Philadelphia means? Brotherly love. Yes. That's, that's why the, the, the word Philadelphia, or the city, the city was called the city of brotherly love. That's what it was called. And it wasn't it didn't get the name from, from um from the church. It got its name from the from the from the guy who owns it or who captured the city and he devoted to his brother. They call it the city of brotherly love. So and um, interestingly, look at the language that the Lord used. I will they will know that the church that is in the city of brotherly love is loved by the Lord. Hello, somebody. Verse number 10. Because thou hast watched this now. And why the Lord said I'm doing it? Because thou hast kept the word. the word of my patience. Thou hast kept my word. And hear this now church of God. And watch this now. This is not isolated again to the church at Philadelphia. And this is not, this is not just, just for the church and uh, Philadelphia. But any child of God who loves the Lord, commit themselves to the things of the Lord. The lo First of all, the Lord loves us. First of all, the Lord loves us. But what if the verse is saying, putting it in context, the Lord will make you become pronounced and prominent and obvious that people will know that there's something about reverent life, there's something about sister life, there's something about brother life. And sometimes they don't live to hear it, but when you when you attend some people's funeral and you hear some of the things that they've said, that they, they're saying about the, the person, you, you sat there and you're in amazement. Because that person might be simple and you just see them there. But they have so much impact and so much influence. Are you still here? So every faithful child of God, the Lord will establish you in such a way that your name will be remembered for the good and the right reason. Are you still here? So I said, Behold, I will make... No, verse number 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also... What? Watch this. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. What an incredible language coming from the Lord himself. And let me quickly clarify here. The word of the Lord here that he said, I will keep you from the hour of temptation. Don't run out of here because say you won't have any more trials because it's not going to happen. Exactly. Hello. <laughs> Don't run out of here and say you're not going to have no, no more trials. That is not what that is referring to. No. That is not what that is referring to. I want you to watch the text. Watch the text with me. Look at the text again. Because you have kept my, my word, the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation. Uh, right? I have a comma right there. But what is that hour of temptation? Which shall come upon what? All the world. So the hour of temptation that the Lord is referring to is not the, the individual trial in and testing in our lives. That's not what, Lord, what the Lord is referring to. The Lord is referring to something that is global that is going to come up and affect the entire world. Are you still here? So, if you will, I, I, let me read the verse and then I go back and comment on it. That shall, which shall come upon all the world. To, to what? To try them that dwell it upon the earth. So, this is a global thing now. So, you can probably take that statement now and fast forward it to the tribulation. Hello? Take that statement now and fast forward it and put it right in the tribulation. Because that is the only event that is left in, in history so far that has not taken place that will affect and impact the whole world. Uh, I don't think it's a global pandemic. 
Hello, somebody. I don't think I don't think it's a global pandemic because um, Christians are being affected by it as well. To correct. So and it, it's not referring to the global pandemic. It is referring to a specific time. You notice it said the hour. Meaning that a certain time period. Uh, I, I reckon everybody know what, how much minutes make an hour. So it is referring to a specific set time and season. So it says the hour of temptation that shall come upon the entire world. And as I, as I read that, I, it, it was so amazing. We can watch this now. Couple of things now. One. Everybody from the church at Philadelphia will be long gone home to glory. Hello. Hello. Everybody from the tribulation, from the, from the church at Philadelphia will be long gone home to glory. We're going to get to it in Revelation, but let me say it here now. There are those great theologians, and I love them, and I have no issues with them at all. But when they're dealing with eschatology, our end time, they divide up the tribulation into, into three opinions, if you will. One of them they call pre-trib, pre-tribulation. Those great minds who believe in pre-tribulation are saying that the church will be raptured before the tribulation. Those are those are those are that those are the ones. That's the one who hold that the pre-trib. Okay, hold that. Then you have the one them that believe in um, mid-trib. Middle of the tribulation, so the tribulation is going to divide it into two, two and a half year period. So there are those who believe that the church will be here uh, for the first two and a half years out of the tribulation. All right, that's why. And then you have uh, the post trip. There are those who are saying that the church will be here to the entire time of the tribulation and then the rapture will take place at the end of the tribulation. Those are the three positions right, they, uh, that have been taken in eschatology. Uh, here is the thing. Here's the thing. I don't know which Bible they're reading. I don't know which Bible they're reading. But in this book here, in this book here, in this book here, the Bible makes it abundantly clear that the church, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, will not face the tribulation. Whether that be half of it, three quarters of it, one third of it, two thirds of it, the church will not face it according to this Bible here. Amen. So the hour of temptation here could be referring to the end time and the tribulation period. But the Lord says here, what he said he will do, he said, I will keep you from the hour of temptation or the hour of trials or whatever the case might be. Because the Bible let us know that the children of God are not appointed unto the wrath of God. The tribulation, and especially the great tribulation, is the wrath of Almighty God being poured out on the earth. So, you want to tell me that God is going to pour out His wrath upon His own children? Hello, somebody. Listen, 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 listen. It doesn't matter if you believe in pre-trib, post-trib, or mid-trib. Mid it doesn't matter which of the trip that you believe in. It will not affect your salvation. So let's clarify that. It will not affect your salvation. You're, you're saved. And, and, and watch this now. It don't matter which one of the truth that you believe in, none of us will be here to experience it anyway. Hello, somebody. But for now, man is going to hold an opinion. So those are the three positions. Let's get back to that. This here now. So it says here, um, Behold, I will come quickly. Uh, no, verse 10, right? It says, but because thou hast kept my word of the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world, all the world, all the world, to try them and to try them that dwell upon the earth. So the Lord said he will keep them um, from that and obviously keep us from it as well. To verse 11, behold, I come quickly. And I gotta pause here and ask the question: How quick is quickly? <laughs> I gotta pause. I can't let that go by. I gotta pause and ask: How quick is quickly? Because this was almost two thousand years ago. Yeah. Hello. How quickly? How quick is quickly? This is almost two thousand years ago. 
and we're still waiting at the Lord's return. <laughs> Hello, somebody. Some things are just so mind-boggling in Scripture. The Lord did not put a time frame. And again, the psalmist says, A day in the presence of the Lord is like a thousand um, years, and a thousand years is like unto a day. So what seems to us like eternity is just a short breath of time in the presence of Almighty God. So even though he said, I'm coming quickly, and it seems like so many years have passed, the truth of the matter is, he's still coming. One thing that I can say to us tonight, as a by means of consolation, we are closer now than when John wrote this. Amen. Hello, somebody. Amen. And one of the things that, that you can look at now is that there is literally no more scripture to be fulfilled before the church is raptured. Pretty much the portion of Bible that is left to be fulfilled is going to be after the rapture of the church. Hello. Isn't that amazing? Everything, there's no more scripture that at least I know of as a student of the book that, that is left to be fulfilled before the church's rapture. So guess what? The church can be raptured at any time. We are in 2021. I think the Jewish calendar is 57, 57 what? I don't remember 57 what. But from my perspective, don't go out and believe this, from Bishop Blackwood's perspective, I believe the Jewish calendar is, is a more accurate calendar than the Gregorian calendar that we're using. So I'm keeping my eyes on the Jewish calendar as it relates to the rapturing of the church. Why are you doing that, preacher? If I begin to tell you, I'm going to have to take you all the way back to Genesis in order to explain why I'm believing the Jewish calendar. The Jews are getting closer to 6,000 years according to their calendar. When you get to 6,000 years, something major is going to happen on planet Earth. I can guarantee you that. But that's a discussion for another day. But I kind of want to lean towards their calendar over our calendar that we're using here. So if you're smart, you go look and see what year the Jews are. Because any time within that, in my opinion, all right, let's, let me get back to the verse. What verse are we? Verse number 11, right? Yes. It says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. So hold fast. And, and this is literally impossible because nobody can take out the, out the believer's crown. So that is literally. But the expression is hold fast. Continue to be committed. Continue to be devoted. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go no more out and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God which is the new Jerusalem which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And basically here if you are a Jewish person or the Jews would understand this context here. A pillar in the temple of the, of the Lord is that if you can imagine and picture the temple, the, the, the literal temple that they had in Jerusalem they have these columns and these um, things that, that uh, the structure of the temple that they refer to as pillar. So when the Lord said, I'll make your pillow, it, it, it refer, it's referring to one of those columns that, they can, that can, they can visualize with their mind. They can see the, the, the temple. They can see all the pillars that hold the temple together or the, the columns that hold the temple um, together. They can see that. So the Lord is saying that I'm going to strategically place you in my kingdom. Hello. I'm going to strategically place you in my kingdom. So in my kingdom, you will be, you will have influence, you will have position, and everybody. And again, this could be referring to the millennial kingdom here as well. Because in eternity, in eternity, 
None of us will need to know anything because we will all know everything that we need to know. And nobody, there will be no gospel preach in eternity. There will be no need to witness it. There is nothing that is going to have to do with salvation that's going to take place in eternity. So if it's here now, it says, it says here, which uh, I will make thee a pillow in the temple of my God. It means that what the Lord is saying to the church here, what I'm going to do to you, somebody will see and recognize. Are you still here? If somebody's going to see and recognize, it tells me that this is going to take place in the millennial kingdom. So in other words, the believers will be prominent in the millennial kingdom. Are you here? And I'm still trying to figure that out because we're going to be in our glorified state and you're going to have people in their flesh and blood in the kingdom. Hello. So look at the verse again. Slow down. Look at the verse. He that overcometh will I make a pillow in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write my and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which come down from out of heaven, um, from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. And again, I've mentioned before that some of these um uh, some of these um, blessings that are mentioned here, um, it literally, uh, it, it, it's not going to be something that, okay, for instance, for instance, it said, I will write um, my name, my new name on him or whatever the case might be. It, it, it's not going to be a case where everybody is going to be walking around with a name written on them, tattoo on them for that matter. The mere fact that you and I are Christian, guess what happened? The name of Christ is already up on us. Amen. Amen. Hello. Yes. We might not feel that way now because we're still struggling. We are still in the process of, uh, 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 of, of sanctification. But when we get into the millennial kingdom, when, we, when the church is raptured, we'll go home to be with the Lord. There won't be any more issues that we will struggle with. So we will become who God intends for us to be in the first place. So we will become practically what we are positionally right now. Are you here? So when it says here that we will become this or that, in other words, we will be with the Lord and we will be who he wanted us to be and he will position us to serve in his millennial kingdom for the things that he wants us to do. And the Bible tells us that we will be sitting on throne and we will be judging of the nations as well too. And then it goes on to say, He that have an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the church. So the church at Philadelphia here, the Lord have great commendation. You notice there is nothing negative about the church at Philadelphia here. If they were able to live and to live righteous and to live holy and live a life that was pleasing to God, guess what? It is possible that we can still do it today in the 21st century. Amen, somebody? Amen. Any comment, any question? Any comment, any question? Are we good? Yes. So that's the church, the church in the city of brotherly love where the Lord has great commendation. And this is one of the great encouragement um, in the body of Christ for us to, to live holy and to do that which is right. Because again, sometimes we operate as if, as if Christ is so distant from his church. We have so we have so drifted in our faith and in our understanding of the church and who God is and the Holy Ghost and and so we behave as if God is some um, distant um, being who is a uh, quadrillion miles away and does not know what is going on in His church. Well, let me tell you something. He's right here, right now, in the person of the Holy Ghost. And he's intimately involved in his church every single moment of the day. Everywhere, in every denomination. And the sooner we recognize who he is in our lives and commit ourselves to him, the better our local congregation will be. There are some, there are some local congregations that are shining stars in the earth today. Are you still here? 
that and not not that everyone is at the same place but they are congregation who are shining star today they are doing everything and they're having so much influence and so much impact in the earth we need to strive as a local congregation, not competing with anybody, not competing with anybody, but to live up to the standard by which scripture has called us to live. And in so doing, the blessing and the favor of God will be upon us and we will have influence and impact in the earth. Amen. Amen. So let me encourage us tonight, if we if we are going to emulate one of these churches so far, the church at Philadelphia is the one for us to emulate and to take something from what the Lord has said to that church and let us apply to our local congregation and then strive to be committed and to be faithful under all circumstances and allow the Lord to bless his people. And on that note tonight, and we will close. I trust that I've said something that has been a blessing and an encouragement um, to us. Next week, God's willing, we're going to quickly go to um, the next um, church, which is the church at um, Laodicea. And then we're going to go into some serious stuff. Chapter 4 talks about throne in heaven. So after we have gone to the next church, then we have to now start set our sight on heaven, which your sight should have already been set. Amen, somebody? Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We're going to just close off in prayer. Let us just pray. Father, we bless you for this night. We thank you, mighty God, that we were able to come into your presence to study your word. Mighty God, I've shared with the best way that I know how in the hearing of your people. Holy Spirit, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you will take that which I have imparted unto your people tonight, that God, you will bring clarity and understanding to their hearts and to their minds and cause them to grow in the things of Almighty God. Continue to bless us as a church, God. Continue to bless your people and make your face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. Mighty God, we commit everything to you and will look to you and glorify your great name. These mercies we pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ and the people of God will declare. Amen, amen and amen. God bless you. Good night and have a wonderful evening to my viewing audience until we meet again in this fashion. Good night.